Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We're thrilled to welcome artist Kat Del Buono uh, as tonight's guest speaker. Kat holds a BA in, from uh, Boston College and an MFA from the School of Visual Arts in photography, video, and related media. She also attended NYU's Tisch School of the Arts graduate, program, graduate film program. Trained as a photographer and filmmaker, Del Buono creates uh, video installations and public happenings that focus on gender and social issues. Her works have, been, have sh uh, been shown in the US and abroad, including at the Bronx Museum, Vetlanda Museum Sweden, Fonland Digital Arts Festival Portugal, uh, Blue Sky Gallery Fountain Art Fair, uh, Kashama NYC, and Mocha Miami. Her, her awards include the, the Bronx Museum um, AIM program, the ICE uh, Cultural Foundation grant, Bang Burn New Works grant, Awesome Foundation grant, NIFA Strategic Stipend, and the SVA Alumni Association Award. She's been an artist in residence at the Arts Center South Florida and the Gallery Le Pen in Barcelona. Her ongoing project, Voices, has received extensive press coverage, including the, um, the Art Newspaper, Miami Herald, College Art Association, and the Charlotte Observer. So please um, help me give a warm welcome to Cat Del Bueno to our lecture series. Thanks. Hi. Thanks for that, Tom. So as Tom said, um, I have a background in I actually have a background in photography and film. Um, so what I was interested in was kind of combining the two mediums, in a sense. Um, I'm going to show you some of like the earlier stuff that works with that, and then move on to like what I've been doing lately. So this was called Tears. And what it is, I, I wanted to kind of take the photo to like the next level. And for me, that was like having something that looked like a photo, but would like have a little movement in it. So I'm going to show you this. But see how it's displayed like a photograph. It's mounted. It's framed. It has a mat. I don't like that plug there, by the way. But and it just has a subtle movement. As you can see, you guys probably know this reference. This is um, based off of Man Ray's photograph called Tears. And I just basically gave her life. So she, there's just a slight movement of her blinking. And this was shown at Fountain Art Fair in Miami and New York. And she is actually another SBA alumnus. So that's it. I mean, it just mimics the photograph, but gives her life. So she moves. Another one that I did that was uh, similar to that whole concept. This is an actual photograph from the 1933 US Attorney's Office. And in that photo is my husband's grandfather and Thomas Dewey, if you guys know Thomas Dewey of Dewey Beats Truman. Uh, he's in the center. And when I saw this photo, I, I don't know, I kind of wanted to also bring it to life. Can you hear the clock? All right, so I just, I don't know, I really had this urge to, to bring it to life. Again, bring that photograph like one step further by adding a slight movement. And then, so it kind of feels like they're waiting for their picture to be taken, you know? They're just waiting. They're stuck in this time zone or something. So that's that. Then I also became interested in going beyond just single channel video. So I started doing like multiple projections and trying to create environments for my visitors, my viewers, so that they could experience, you know, whatever I wanted to show them. And this project is, this is in my mom's village in a small town like outside of Naples in Italy where it, time has kind of stood still. That in the, I couldn't find the video, I apologize, but that is a donkey pulling a cart. So like it's that kind of like they're still a little bit backwards. So in the installation it would come up that right hand screen, the donkey came up and then he goes up that way. And then you, you just see like different people in the town, you know, doing their daily activities like buying fruit at the market or just like the elderly people hanging out and just chatting or singing. And the whole idea is again to like 
have people like feel like that they're right there, you know, in the town, experiencing like what I would see when I'm there visiting my family. Um, another example of using multiple screens, I did this documentary. I grew my hair really, really long, like stupid long, specifically because I wanted to cut it all off and have a wig made for somebody who needed it. So I was looking into locks of love, and it turns out they throw away a lot of the hair. If it's not long enough, if it's been like dyed or if it's damaged, they, they just throw it out. So that was already like, eh. And I couldn't, I wanted to document the whole process. So it just happened around that time that my cousin's wife got cancer and she needed a wig. So I was gonna cut off all my hair and have a wig made for her because she was really into long hair. And I'm gonna show you just a little quick clip of this documentary. It uses multiple screens, but it touches on this idea of like long hair in females, because that, that her whole thing was all about, she's all about long hair, you know, and, and there's a, you know, when women cut off their hair, you know, people react to that. Why did she do that? You know, did she just, you know, lose her boyfriend or is she trying to make a statement or whatever? It, it does make a statement for whatever reason, but we'll get into that. So this is just a quick clip I'm gonna show you. It all started as a way to save money by not going to the hairdresser. But then it became more of a, let's see how long it can get. Middle of the back, then lower back. And now my hair has become more than just hair. It's like having a pet or a really long scarf with you all the time, everywhere you go. People love it, but they have no idea what it's like to keep it. They're so distracted by the hair itself that they aren't looking at the whole picture. Me with the hair doesn't work. I noticed I was losing a lot of hair, whether it was in the shower when I'm combing it with conditioner or just all over the place. And I thought, I need to save these hairs because they're so long. And if I'm gonna cut my hair and have a wig made out of it, those hairs actually would come in handy. I have very mixed feelings about you cutting your hair off. Very nervous about how you're gonna look. I'm very uh, comfortable and used to you looking a certain way. Um, I think that you're very, very beautiful with your long curly hair. All right, so that's just a clip. Um, here's just some like still shots from the video. I just wanna say that was so much fun. Cutting my own hair off was so much fun. I don't know if you guys ever had Barbies when you were little and you wanted to cut their hair, but maybe you didn't because you didn't want to destroy them forever. That's what that felt like. It was so much fun. Anyway, so here's another still shot. I loved it. It was so freeing. And my, my head tingled for like a month. All right. Another project I did that, you know, used more than just a single channel video, this was two channels, it was on two separate monitors. Oh, by the way, sorry, that documentary was done while I was at SVA. This one as well was done while I was at SVA. It was a two channel video and what I did was ride on the four train the, the whole way back and forth for like a couple of weeks and I would go up to people and I would ask them if I could do their video portrait. And I was shocked that most of them said okay. So I, I would film them, and then at the end, I would say, tell me something that you like about yourself. Because at the time, I was watching Nip Tuck. I don't know if you guys remember that. Do you remember, like, when the clients would come in, they'd be like, tell me what you don't like about yourself. So I kind of wanted to do something, you know, positive. Why, why do we got to think about what we don't like about ourselves? Tell me something you like about yourself. So it was actually a, a good experience. It was a little scary at times, but I don't know. I, I really had a nice connection with the people and I also found I wanted to test myself like do I know who they are just by looking at them can I tell anything about them most of the time I was wrong so it was it was an interesting experiment but I have a quick little clip for you here as well you're going to be seeing a lot of video so just warning you um, my height six feet tall I ain't got no kids I'm 25 years old light skin black
everything. I'm an artist. I'm a writer. I have my own CDs. That I write my own song, sing it myself. I think I'm, I'm kind and I listen to what people have to say and I'm humorous. I like that I'm smart and I'm confident about myself and that I'm independent. My son's a bit disabled, uh, but it's, it's fun, you know, just exploring everything with him and he loves to train, so it's like his favorite thing. He mocks all the closing doors and everything, so <laughs> it, it's fun and I think that's, you know, what I like about myself most. All right. This uh, is another video installation that I did. Um, it actually originated in 2003. I did it for the Dumbo Arts Festival, which is no longer, which is kind of sad. Um, and I projected it onto the East River. So the whole idea behind this was that since the river is so polluted, we're never gonna see like fish and people swimming around. So what I wanted to do was like, if it can't happen in reality, I was gonna make it happen virtually. So I projected it onto the river. And then I started showing it in different cities. Recently, I just showed it at um, the Currents uh, New Media Festival out in New Mexico. And so now it's become more of a, like what our future may be, what our future interactions with nature may be, because we're destroying our nature, so maybe this is, we're gonna have to experience it virtually. Who knows? So, and then there's like people that swim by and whatnot. So, um, then I, I did a residency in, in Miami in 2009, and I noticed around me there was a lot of plastic surgery. And I'm gonna show you this next slide. Even the mannequins had these ginormous breasts. And there was, it was so obvious to me that there was a specific beauty standard that I was seeing a lot of, even with young women, like, you know, the big lips and the big boobs, and everybody was very conscious about what they look like. So that started to get me thinking a little bit. Um, I'm gonna show you some other stuff. I went to this Drake concert, I don't know why, but, um, and the girls were all like wearing these short, short skirts and high, high heels, like they could barely walk. And my only way of dealing with it that evening was to like take photos and video of this because I was just, like, what is going, where am I? I was just, I, this was a few years ago and, I, and it's more common now, I guess, but I'm just like, what's going on here? So. These are just some of the shots. And then I started realizing, you know, it's not, it wasn't just happening in Miami, it's happening all over the place. Everything we see on television, music videos, I'm gonna play this for you too. Um, just a sample of what we're seeing on TV and the media. I mean, constantly, we see this so often that we don't even think about it. We're like so numb to this, it's become like the norm. There's, I mean, I mean, even kids with, the, okay, the beauty pageant stuff, I don't know. Anyway, um, so as you can see, women are be, being portrayed in a specific way, okay? They're conforming to a specific look, and they're playing a specific role. And to me, this was infuriating. Um, I want to show you one other example. This is Italian TV. I think you guys kind of get the idea. You've got like these women who, I mean, you, you would think you switched over to like a soft core porn channel, but this is like family time TV during lunchtime and dinner time. And it was like game shows and talk shows and they would take a break for these women to come out and do their little thing. I mean, it was like bizarre. And this, you know, it's just no one even thought about it, but 
an interesting is that thing is that I found out recently that they found out that there's been a spike in domestic violence and in sexism. I think there's a relationship there, just putting it out there. So all the stuff that I was noticing, whatever, and getting infuriated about, I wanted to somehow deal with it in my works. So how do you do that without alienating people, without you know, pointing fingers and getting mad and being you know, the angry feminist or whatever? I'm like, all right, I'll try humor. So I did, this was one of the first videos I did. I did something before this, but um, for me, this was like what plastic surgery looks like and feels like to me. So I'm gonna play you this. So that was that. So then I, I was at this residency in Barcelona and I, you know, I continued with this whole like plastic surgery idea and finding like the cheaper way to keep up with the trends in plastic surgery. So this one's called facelift. Looks good, right? <laughs> All right. Then I did um, another video, very simple, um, that was kind of triggered from statistics I was reading and information I was getting about how girls and boys start off kind of the same. You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Pretty much the same. You know, they feel confident about themselves. You know, they're going along in the same direction. And then when they hit puberty, the girls start veering towards what they look like is being a focus, right? That's because of what society is telling us. And so this short video, simple short video, is, is, um, it focuses on that and, and how the girls and females begin to be told what their value is in our society.
So that's what we're left with. And I did this really quick little animation while I was in Barcelona as well um, with a fellow artist in residence. And um, well, I'll just show it to you. Um, so this, this was in my, I spent a lot of time in Miami. I spent like, I think was it like four or five winters there. That's what you want to do. And I did this exhibit that was kind of like an interactive sort of thing. And I had these bins out for people to choose what, you know, different breast sizes they might want. And um, so they could have their own enhancements for free and very cheaply done. And so I'm going to show you a clip. I've kind of put a little thing together with, that shows, I hope this works, because I specifically edited this. Oh, cinnamon, where you gonna run to? Cinnamon, where you gonna run to? Where you gonna run to? All on that day. I run to the rock Please hide me and run to the rock Please hide me and run to the rock Please. Oh, so we took it out into the streets with a little flash mob on Lincoln Road in Miami. And people, you know, they laughed. They thought it was funny and whatnot, but they also got the message. They understood what we were doing what we were saying. And then I was invited by um, the pool art fair to do it in New York at the Met. So it was all like, you know, gorilla. And I thought for sure we were gonna get arrested or something, but I mean, they, bar they just smiled at us and completely ignored us. So I guess New Yorkers are like, yeah, whatever. It was bleeding all on that day. So I ran to the river. It was falling around to the sea. Then I moved on to hold on, street posters. I created um, a street art group. We call ourselves Refem and made up posters and went around and plastered them all over Wynwood in Miami, which is like the arts district. And uh, we got written up in the papers a little bit. Um, but it was a lot of fun. And the whole idea was I, I want to do this camp campaign about you know, not getting plastic surgery. So, you know, you guys know like the most interesting man in the world when he says, stay thirsty, my friends. This is stay small, my friends. So I wanted to use images of celebrities who have small breasts already so that people who, like me, have small breasts feel okay about it. And we're not gonna go out and succumb to these trends of getting breast implants, you know, which is a dangerous, unnecessary surgery. Um, so there's nothing, you know, nothing against big breasts. Okay, it's just it's the anti-surgery thing, which I'll show you the little logo we put on the bottom, no surgery. Um, so we did those, we plastered those around a, a number of times. And then we also did uh, a campaign on last name equality. I don't know if you could read that. It says, change my name. I'm getting married, not adopted. So this is something that I feel strongly about, but I won't get into it right now. But you're going to see more of this. So, and this is another one. If you guys don't know, this is Amelia Earhart. 
and she was married to George Putnam. So somehow Mrs. George Putnam just doesn't sound right. Then we did um, this interactive performance. Uh, I called it Beauty Box. This was also in Miami, and it was done during uh, Art Basel. Um, and I worked with a couple of friends who collaborated with me, and we, we put on lab coats, and we, we were pretending like we're doctors. We're there to give you a consultation. That's, that was, you know, we had all these props with us, ready to scare people. <laughs> Giving, you know, it was under the pretense that you're going to come in for a consult and we're going to tell you what you got to fix, right? So, but instead what we did was, and, w and I told them you have to be honest. That was our thing. We have to be honest. So we looked at everybody and we honestly picked out everything that we saw that was beautiful about them. So on their exterior, I mean, I mean, there's so much you can see in people, by the way. I mean, there's just so much beauty, you know, that doesn't conform to what our standards are now. But again, that's arbitrary, right? Who decides what's beautiful? So um, we would do that, but we also also like um, talked about their inner beauty, which my friends who helped me with this had were really good at. I don't know, they like really got to people. Like they're like, wow, how did you know that? So that that was really interesting to see. And we had both women and men come in, and I made up little prescription pads, and I would write, "You are perfect just the way you are," and give it to them. And we gave out little medals for being a natural beauty. Um, so women came in scared, but left feeling like really good about themselves and like, oh my God, this is the best thing, you know, and some women like were teary eyed. So it was a really interesting interaction that we had with them. And what was interesting too was the men who came in, came in very confident. See the difference? Like women are, you know, they're ready to be picked apart and told what's wrong with them. The men came in with this confidence. So what we did with them, we talked a little bit about their exterior, but we, we tried to get in a little more deeper with these guys. Because, you know, there's the whole idea of masculinity that you, you, there's, you guys, you know, with this macho, whatever. So we tried to get in a little deeper and talk about who they were inside. And again, my friends were pretty good at this. So that was that. Um, and this, recently I did this for Chashama, which is a art, nonprofit art organization. Uh, they had a big gala and it was in Times Square. So we just did that there and um, people love it. So it's amazing how just saying a couple nice things to somebody can really pick up their mood. So just like the previous works were influenced by what I was seeing in Miami, um, you know, with the whole beauty thing, the, the next works I'm going to show you were also influenced by what I was seeing in the news. I did this piece that was, do you guys remember Sandra Fluke? She was a uh, Georgetown University student law student, and she testified in front of Congress about women's reproductive rights and contraception. She got so much flack from conservatives and like Rush Limbaugh. I mean, the stuff they were saying about her was just disgusting. So I did a whole video that, you know, every time she's talking, like something would interrupt her and I would use clips of what Rush Limbaugh was saying. So that was one of them. And then I'm sure you all remember what politicians were saying when it came to rape and abortion and how, you know, women don't have a right to have an abortion even in the case of rape, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to show you a few clips and I removed, okay, let me explain. I took actual clips of politicians, which happen to be white males, and talking about, you know, what they think about rape and, and what they think about, you know, abortion, whatever. Anyway. And I put it side by side with clips of rape scenes from movies. So you, you hear them and you see the scene, you hear them, you see the scene. So I did that on purpose to kind of like put this into context, okay? You know, what are you guys talking about? So hopefully this plays. And I'm going to show you a couple clips of what the politicians said. This contraceptive thing, my gosh, it's so it's such inexpensive. You know, back in my days, they used bare aspirin for contraceptives. The gals put it between their knees, and it wasn't that costly. It seems to me, first of all, from what I understand from doctors, that's really rare. If it's a legitimate rape, uh, the female body has ways to try to shut that whole thing down. And my favorite. You know, the, the right approach is to is to accept this horribly created in the sense of, of rape, but nevertheless gift. 
in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very broken way, the gift of human life, and accept what God is giving to you. As, as, as you know, we have to, in ev lots of different aspects of our life, we have horrible things happen to I can't think of anything more horrible, but nevertheless, we have to make the best out of a bad situation. So, and it goes on. There's a, there's a lot of these. Okay. Remember, he was running for president. Just, just a reminder. So, again, instead of getting angry again, you know, I wanted to put that into my works. Um, but I, I don't know if you guys remember the Steubenville thing that happened in Steubenville, Ohio, with a, a young girl who was passed out drunk. And these guys completely sexually assaulted her and videotaped and photographed and like, I mean, it was like a, a big thing. Um, so the reaction, you know, that's, that colleges did after this, colleges, schools, website, whatever, they put out like a, a list of advice for women on how you can avoid being raped. Okay, no one talked about how boys cannot rape, but women, what you can do to avoid being raped. And the, the list that they had up there was, a lot of it was ridiculous. Like one of them, and you, I'm going to show you a clip, but one of them talked about, you know, vomit and urinate yourself. Tell them you're menstruating so that, okay, whatever. So this was my reaction to that. I took actual advice. I didn't make anything up. I took the actual advice that I found online and on these college websites, and I had my actress play them out. Um, in a very like 1950s instructional video way. So I'm going to show you a couple clips. It's called How to Not Get Raped. Try wearing clothing that's not easy to remove, like <coughs> jumpsuits, overalls, or by adding belts. <coughs> Ponytails and long hair are easy to grab, so choose your hairstyle wisely. Remember, your choice of footwear can make the difference between getting raped or getting away. Always bring a friend when you go out and tell them where you're going at all times. Or always bring a dog. Choose your venue wisely. No one will hear you scream for help at a loud club. Also, beware of bathrooms. Many attacks occur there. Remember, don't get drunk. Beware of vans. They're the number one rapist vehicle. If you encounter a rapist in your car, drive into a lamppost or a dumpster. Or if you're in the passenger seat, don't be afraid to jump out of a moving car. Remember, anything can be used as a weapon. Tell your attacker that you have a disease or are menstruating. Vomiting and urinating may also deter an attacker. Fight like a psychotic cat. It's better to seem crazy than get raped. Also, leave a mark on your rapist to make it easier for him to be caught later. Make eye contact with a potential attacker. Don't make eye contact with a potential attacker. Don't put yourself in a situation where you can be raped. Avoid isolation. Avoid walking alone. Avoid poorly lit areas. Avoid elevators with a lone stranger. Avoid giving a guy blue balls. So you get the idea. So this, um, I put it up on YouTube, just because, and someone emailed me and they're like, hey, did you see Jezebel wrote about it? I'm like, oh. And so then I was getting all these articles written about this from time.com, Huffington Post, BuzzFeed. So, and then I, I was looking at the numbers on YouTube going up and up and up. I'm like, oh my God, this is like going viral. Good, let's get the conversation going here, right? So I didn't hit a million yet, but maybe you all can help with that, which would be nice. Um, so after that, uh, I wanted to do a project on domestic violence. And I, I went, when I was at the Whitney, it was a few years back, there was a, an installation by Lorna Simpson which kind of had this whole grid of different, I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, I can't remember the name of it, I apologize. But it's all these mouths, right? And it's all these lips, and they're, they're all humming along to the same song. And, and that kind of clicked in my head. I was like, ah, 
this is how I can do this project by, and, and keep them anonymous. Because that was one of the issues I was having when I was talking to domestic violence organizations and shelters was how do you keep them anonymous if they don't want to like expose who they are because a lot of these women are in danger. So the mouth. Um, and again, in Miami, I went to a shelter. I met with this woman. I showed her some of my other works. She trusted me. And I filmed uh, the women there who actually really wanted to talk about what they went through. And I wanted to hear about what they went through, but also how they, how they got out. And I was really surprised to hear how interested they were to share their stories, but also to reach out to other women who might be in similar situations. They really wanted to help others, which for me it was hard to understand. If I were in that situation, I don't know if I would be able to talk about it, and I definitely don't know if I would be able to, to uh, you know, reach out to someone else and try to help them. I, but anyway, this is where it was first installed. It was in Chicago about two years ago. Um, just so you all know, I've been going to different uh, cities, working with different organizations, and collecting more and more stories, and then I install them. So what I did was I put each mouse, instead of having a grid pattern, say like Lorna Simpson's piece, I wanted each mouse to be represented on a separate monitor, so that it's like an individual, you know? So they were, they're lined up, you know, on the walls of a gallery space. And when you walk in, you just hear this, you know, all these voices. And you don't, you can't make out what they're saying, but it, it's, it's kind of overwhelming. And until you get close enough to a monitor, you're not going to hear their story. So that kind of plays as a metaphor, too. Here we are, you know, in our communities. We don't even know this is going on. You really don't know what, how many people are affected. I mean, just after I did this project, I had a number of friends come up to me and tell me I was in a domestic violence situation. So we don't know that this is happening right under our noses. So the metaphor is until you get close, you're not going to know the story. So. I've been taking it to different cities. I've been also adding panel discussions now because I want the community involved so that they can hear from advocates and from survivors and from law enforcement and we can talk about what's going on, why it's happening, and what can we do to stop it. So um, this is a clip from Chicago. To me, I thought it was all my fault and that it was just, I would make excuses for my abuser. When this was all going to stop, I don't know if it was after he burned me with hot water, locked me in a closet for three days and didn't feed me, didn't allow me to leave, use the restroom, or when he broke my face. And now I am desperately trying to find who I am again. I know this is a new thing for me. After 20 years, I didn't know that the love of my life was going to basically take everything from me. When you think it's going to change, it never changes. Only thing that I have to change is me. I have to know I don't want to be hurt anymore. Llegó al punto de hacerme creer que yo no servía para nada, que yo no podía pensar, no podía actuar. Me hizo sentir que no valía. And I had my head busted open. And I was done. Pretty much done. And slapping her. And would usually end with my mother calling out my name to come save her. I was being abused until the day my fiance came into my room, put a pillow over my head, and stabbed me 18 times. Left me for dead in my apartment for over two hours while he stood over my bleeding body. So that's just a sampling of some of the stories um, that you would see in my installation. Um, that might happen. Hold on. All right, so that project has shown, that is shown last year at uh, the Bronx Museum. It showed at uh, MOCA in North Miami, um, Chicago. I filmed in Connecticut. I was out in Orange County 
in California, and it's going to be in Portland, Oregon this July. We're going to do a panel discussion, the whole thing. I also did it down um, at Winthrop University, which is in South Carolina. And I think I want to continue doing this at universities and dealing with younger people because even though, believe it or not, I filmed like six girls there who were teenagers who were in domestic violence situations or who had gotten out of them. I mean, it starts, it starts young, but I think if I can reach out to the younger generation and try to help them understand what a healthy relationship looks like and doesn't look like, um, I don't know, maybe we can nip this in the bud um, and prevent it from even happening. Because we have a lot of people who take care of the women after the fact, but we're not really talking about preventing that much. Maybe a little bit, but I have my own theories, okay? So all these projects I showed you are related, okay? I'm going to use my note cards so I don't babble. Um, so they're, they're related not just because they're feminist and they deal with social issues, but because they're, they all originate from the same thing we talked about in the beginning, which was this idea of beauty, this beauty standard that's being imposed on women. Um, and you may think, okay, what does beauty have to do with rape or domestic violence? Well, this constant bombardment of images and the ads and TV shows, films, video games, etc., is shaping our society, and it's where we're learning from most, especially young kids. So girls and women are being depicted in this manner. The message is being sent that that's where our soul value lies in. Um, and it's also telling us that, that's, that our purpose in life is to please the male. And that's what we're telling boys and men as well, that that's the purpose of women and that they're entitled to this. So you can see where this is going, right? So when you watch, and also when you watch um, TV, movies, video games, whatever, the protagonists are mostly male. Um, and when you see females, they're what? They're the sex object, the you know, love interest, the sidekick, the one who's being you know, killed or, or kidnapped. Um, so that, believe it or not, affects us because we're seeing it constantly. We're being bombarded with this. And it, it also plays into our everyday life. If you look at CEOs, mostly male, right? Look at a government mostly male. So um, what is this telling us? What is this telling the kids? You know, that, that females are not as important. It's telling us that we're not equal and that we're not, and we're less than the male. So all of this does add up and it does affect rape, especially, you know, rape culture on college campuses. It does affect that. And like I was talking about the whole thing, those weird Italian shows, I mean, there's been an uptick in violence against women which I th coincides with these shows. So um, it affects rape culture. It affects domestic violence as well as inequality in our workplace and in the government. So what I want to do is to remind you all that the image is powerful. There's, st there's statistics out there that show that we react stronger to images than we do to text. So you need to be aware of what you're making and what you're showing because I, f I feel like we have a responsibility, okay? So no matter what medium you work in, your choices matter. And I encourage you, think about including women. We are 51% of this population. You would never know that by looking at all those things we talked about, government, TV, whatever. 51%, we're the majority. Um, so I want you to think about including women in whatever you do. And I want you to be careful about how you portray them as well. Um, and I encourage you to also not think, oh, well, you know, whatever, that's just how it's always been. No. No, we got to move beyond that. We got we to gotta question the status quo. We got to get people to, to think a little bit more beyond just the, like, oh, that's how it's always been, because that's how change happens, and change for the good, change for the better. So that's what I'm trying to do with my works, and I have a lot more to do. So that's it. We have a couple minutes for questions. Um, we have a microphone uh, for you to use if, when uh, you ask a question. It doesn't amplify your voice, it's just for the video. Any questions? So I um, thank you for your presentation, it was really great. Um, I noticed on, um, like with internet and the social media, there's a lot of women taking control of their image and they're 
and so we have a lot of images uh, by us that are out there, but then there's also like a lot of objectification that's put out there that you can see all the time. And so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. On, um, I guess, how uh, social media and apps and all of those things change the perception, or if it changes the perception of women um, since you know, people are looking, a lot more people, especially the younger generation, are looking to those things instead of just what's being given to us by larger media corporations. Right. There's like... Well, it depends on who's doing it, right? I mean, but it, I, when, I, when I see, like, pictures that girls are putting up, it's still very, like, they're objectifying themselves, you know? Like, the, I mean, it's incredible how many times you'll, like, be walking down the street and there'll be some girl, like, you know, prepping for her selfie, you know? doing the duck lip thing, you know? I mean, that, that does, that's the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So regardless of, of whether it's some big corporate, whatever, or we're doing it to ourselves. I think, I think that's part of the issue is that we're not, we're not even aware that we're doing it to ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I guess that's what I, that's what I was talking about. Just because I think about it, I do think about that a lot, how there's um, a lot of really powerful images, but also a lot of, a lot of objectification and how it's like this weird space, like, you, you can see both of it, and I'm just wondering if that changes people's perceptions or how, you know, I don't know. But yeah, your answer is, is <laughs> it, I got my question. It, it depends on what, you know, what images they're putting up too. Mm -hmm. You know, because remember, I mean, a lot of the images females are, are in or even doing themselves is for the male gaze, and as long as it's still for the male gaze, we're not changing anything, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kat, for coming. I'm trying to figure out a way to ask this question, but I, I was looking uh -oh. at this. No, no, it's not a, just let me, I'm about to figure it out. <laughs> anyway, there's this new campaign, it's like uh, Sugar sugar Babies, where women, after college, they try to figure, like, they try to find sugar for the sugar daddies. That's funny that you say that. That's yeah. one of my next posters. And I was just about Be to ask Be your own sugar daddy. That's, that's the hilarious. tag. But I was about to say if there was, I was about to ask you if there's any way you would possibly protest that and like, like basically the way you were actually having the balloons and the lips. Oh, absolutely. If, would you that, ever like raid that, like and protest that in any type of way? Hell yeah. Okay, dope. Are you kidding? Of course. That, that was, I swear to God, this is like, that was my next poster campaign that I want to do. Be your own sugar daddy. Absolutely. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, right? Definitely. Yeah. There's something going on about that? Oh, no, I'm saying you need to be protested. It's stupid. No, I mean like that's a movement. Yes, yeah, like literally, it's a convention where women actually are taught on how uh, to capture uh, sugar daddies, and uh, and most people, yeah, it's literally a whole movement. It's a ex, it's a not an exhibition, it's an expo where women come, and it's funny because most people are sitting there talking about, oh, most of these girls are dumb. Then when they have the caption, it was like Yale University and Harvard. So a lot of these girls are actually coming from top Ivy League schools, and they think it's an educational factor, but it's not. It's a financial factor and a, I th think it's definitely a self-esteem factor. Ugh. And I was just thinking if there's a possible way you would possibly protest that. Absolutely. Want to join me? Let's <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk later. So stupid. <laughs> so, uh, Kat, I did have one, one question about uh, at Miami Art Basel. Um, huh? when you, the project you did at Miami Art Basel that's uh, where I would expect a, a lot of wealthier people there who have had a lot of plastic surgery. Did you, did anyone come in who fit that? Not that I could tell. No. Okay. Yeah, it was surprising. Right, yeah. That's, yeah. It was, I was uh, wondering how I would handle that. Exactly, that situation. Yeah, right? yeah, I was a little worried about that, but I didn't have anybody. It was surprising. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? I think if I did have somebody, yes. I would focus on their inner beauty. Absolutely. I would completely <laughs> avoid, avoid the... the, situ the, the yeah. Right. So uh, we have to thank you so much for your uh, the um, voice you're trying to get bring to the these issues of uh, for for women in general, but for society in general. And it's fantastic. And the humor you bring to it is really inspiring. It's really fantastic. Cool. So thank, thank you so you. much. Thanks. <laughs>